slides. So welcome everyone and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Dylan Hall, I'm a Cyber Threat Intelligence Analyst with Health ISAC Talk, and I will be introducing today's speakers from Zapirium, as well as the overall objective of today's webinar. Uh, in, in this webinar, Unseen Cyber Threats Lurking in Connected Medical Devices, our speakers will discuss common cyber threats uh, to mobile uh, devices and apps in healthcare, static versus dynamic mobile app security, and real-world examples that uh, use advanced threat protection for mobile applications. Just some housekeeping notes uh, before we kick things off. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and made available should you wish to revisit today's content. Uh, feel free to post questions in the available uh, chat or uh, Q&A uh, throughout the presentation. There will also be about 15 or 20 minutes or so at the end to answer some questions at the end. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it over to our speakers, Andrew and Krishna. And with all that, uh, it's yours, guys. Thanks, Dylan. Folks, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, if you're dialing in from outside the United States. Um, again, this is just a little bit. Again, my name is Krishna Vishnabhatna. I've been at Zimperium for about eight years, a variety of different roles, but really my focus is um, strategy for our app security solutions. So really around where are mobile apps headed in different sectors and what can we do as a product company to help secure these mobile apps as they become more prevalent. And with me is Andrew. Andrew, why don't you just give a quick intro and we go from there. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is Andrew Snyder. Uh, I've been with uh, what's uh, with Zimperium for approximately seven years, although our product group was purchased a couple of years ago. So I was with another organization. It's the same tech stack. And I've been working with medical device, app connected medical device companies for almost the entire time. Um, so really ha have a sense of what is being done currently in the market right now. And we're pretty excited to share uh, both what we've learned and what we see coming in the future. So really glad to to be here and looking forward to talking with you. Great. Let's dive in it, folks. Quick agenda for everybody. I think what we'll do, just the order, we'll talk a little bit about uh, just introduction. Why are we having this conversation? What has this experience been working with medical companies? Uh, what's been our pedigree? Then we'll talk a little bit about market trends, right? Medical devices as such is a big uh, sector. It's booming uh, along with the mobile app sector. We'll get into that a little bit. We'll get into role of mobile. Um, which is really a big key reason why we're doing this webinar, because I think mobile devices itself, you know, had its own attack surface, but with mobile become so prevalent in healthcare and medical devices and uh, chronic pain management and other areas, I think the attack surface has exploded, right? Both we get into the role of mobile. And then we'll talk about the threat, right? With mobile and medical devices coming together, what has happened to the threat landscape and how do we see it evolving across millions of devices? And what are things, if you are app dev, app sec compliance, um, what are things you should look for? And what are our customers actively doing to prep for this? And then we'll spend a few minutes on how can we help? How can Zimperium help, right? We're actively seeing these threats, um, but we're also helping a lot of our customers and prospects understand the threat landscape so that they can build secure, compliant, and resilient mobile applications, right? We'll give a little bit of that. So Andrew, with that, why don't you talk a little bit about, you know, our journey and what our experience has been in the space? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for those of you that may not have heard of Zimperium, a little bit of a company background or is we've been doing application or mobile application security since 2009. Um, most of our customers are in both this connected medical space as well as in the financial space, the, the DRM space, so content protection, as well as in automotive and identity. So things like digital car keys and, and identities that live on mobile devices. We have hundreds of enterprise customers. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, we do both work with a lot of banks and fintechs and payments, basically where everything is, there's something inside your application that is enormously valuable and worth pursuing. That is the space that we live in. And as, as we're here talking, we, we do work with a number of the global leaders in, in the app-connected medical space where you're either providing primary or secondary access to a medical device and delivering therapy. Um, we, we have pretty massive scale. Uh, this is just one of our customers listed once, as well as 
we have a significant uh, investment with Google in making sure that the apps that even make it in, into the store uh, are scanned and protected from threats. And so we're part of what's called the App Defense Alliance. Um, so hopefully our, our experience in this field can be of benefit to you. Um, and also, you know, at least with regards to the webinar, if there are questions, please use the chat. Um, we do have some slides and we are going to talk through how, how we see the world. But since those of you that have joined, if you've got particular questions, please put them in the chat and we'll either uh, interleave them into our conversation or we'll answer them at the end. So um, thanks. All right. So let's start with trends. And as you all know, this space, medical device sector has been booming and has been booming for a while. I think the last three, four years, it's there's been quite a big explosion in this space. A lot more medical devices, right? Um, connected medical devices have shown up. Um, there's a plethora of them. And a lot of these devices, what they have in common is they've become more intelligent and they've also started to have some form of connectivity, right? And both those dimensions have lent lend nicely to, you know, whether it's better quality care or lower costs or whatnot, right? But at the same time, if you look at the mobile apps in the healthcare sector, it is also exploded, right? And there are several reasons for this, but we'll talk about two key reasons why we see the market really likes this combination of medical devices now talking to mobile apps and mobile devices, right? So if you look at it from a healthcare provider perspective, right? Healthcare costs in the US especially are through the roof, right? So there's always, uh, we're always gravitating towards how do we lower costs but provide quality care? So for healthcare providers, the opportunity for us to associate or provide a mobile companion app for a connected medical device is attractive for several reasons. Obviously reducing cost because you can remotely monitor, right? A lot of these devices, you don't have to be in the same place. Patients can go home, right? Outpatient costs, inpatient costs, huge impact. One, you can improve diagnosis, right? There are a lot of companion apps, as you know, that allow patients to track their symptoms in real time. That information is relayed to healthcare providers in real time, right? So a lot more information coming from these mobile apps, allowing for better diagnosis and better care. Real-time monitoring is one specific aspect of this that has really taken off, right? If you think of chronic illness on our planet, I think between your heart, diabetes, um, pretty much is 75% of the market right? So we think insulin pumps, thinks pacemakers, right? The ability to monitor these remotely is very, very attractive and works even from a patient standpoint. Now, if you look at us as consumers and we look at how this space has exploded, when I say healthcare, you start thinking wearables, you start thinking insulin pumps that are connected to medical apps, uh, mobile apps, right? How do we, the way we actually access, look for, and get care has changed, right? It's convenient when you can look for a doctor on your app. It's great that the app gives you personalized information and it's, it's driving costs down, right? So for healthcare providers and patients, there are huge implications of mobile coming into the picture and making it more viable. Uh, Andrew, anything you wanna add to what we're seeing in the market? No, I, I mean, even as a consumer, it's it's of a, a huge value for me to do all of this from my phone or tablet or check on with my family, you know, and we're here to talk about both why it's both so powerful and some of the risks and threats in that universe. But, you know, at this point, I think we I think we continue, but I think we all agree that this is a great thing. The question is just how do we protect it and maintain a, a posture that makes sense? Yeah, so we've all seen some aspect of this every day. Right. Uh, seems like an every day or every week, there's at least a headline um, about phones getting hacked, malware, spyware. Now, the interesting part about this is if you remember traditional medical devices, right, it was a closed system. It was some kind of Linux hardware. 
and there's software running on it. And that's what the attack surface was, right? So before the whole mobile companion app, if medical devices, if there was some kind of vulnerability, something that needed to be patched or something that was attacked, the vendor would most likely have to recall the device, update the software and send it back of some sort, right? So it was, since it was closed loop and the attack surface was limited, it was very, very expensive to fix issues, right? But the advent of mobile apps now connecting to devices, what's essentially happened is now you've inherited the mobile attack surface, which is the device and the app. And what malicious actors have figured out is getting through the mobile door is way easier than me trying to get into the medical device, right? Because the attack techniques are prevalent the reach of the mobile app is prevalent and they already know how to break into Android and iOS phones, right? So it's exponentially increased the attack surface along with the convenience of being associated with the medical device. Uh, Andrew, any thoughts on, is, it, is it, of all these things that we see, do you like, do you gravitate to one the most that you seem to be uh, seeing all over the place? The, uh, the one that I uh, actually in the upper right hand corner, it's the it's the aspect of time, right? We try and, and part of this talk is the static versus dynamic. And, and one of the aspects of the dynamic is time. Like you think you're secure at a certain point in time and you go to market and you're approved and you're providing care. Unfortunately, the world doesn't stop. The, the clock doesn't stop. And so new threats appear without you even trying. Um, and that's the, probably the biggest challenge. What do you do in that? world where you know things are going to change and yet it's the unknown that is is scary at times um yeah so no, that's a great way. point because i think a lot of us ask us oh what threats are out there but i think what's always forgotten is it's not just what threats but then how frequent they are so the solution you choose has to be able to keep up with this uh to some shape or form um so what happens when apps get compromised, right? When you think about medical devices connected to mobile apps, right? The ones that come to mind um, more, more so than ever because they're so prevalent in the market. It could be insulin pumps, you have symptom trackers. Um, we deal with a lot of pharma and they do a lot of trials and they use medical apps to collect the information for trials and so on. So. When apps get compromised, one, if you're thinking about an insulin device, things could very, go very wrong, right? If the data is corrupted, it tells the insulin pump to inject the incorrect amount of insulin, you're in trouble, right? So there are very grave implications on one side. And you also look on the other side, you losing data. If you're a pharma company doing a drug trial and trying to get data, it could cost you a whole ton of money to redo it, right? Your drug couldn't get approved you have all these issues as well. So there are a whole bunch of factors that most of you are aware of when things go wrong when your mobile app's connected. Um, Andrew, I know the regulatory oversight, um, something we talk about a lot. Anything you want to say about just what we've seen? Yeah, there's my take on regulatory, meaning FDA, or depending on where you are in the world, there's different requirements. It's that model is going from sort of suggestion to encouragement to enforcement. And so it's, we're always playing catch up, but then it's also the rules can change almost not quite at a whim, but suddenly from the, the timeline or perspective of, of the medical space. And so anticipating that, or at least having a plan to cover any gaps or any unknowns is really strongly encouraged for new devices and new applications trying to get to market. Um, some of the other circles that we have, you know, obviously there's the ability to lose money, like you lose some customers. Um, with with any time an app gets broken, the brand risk of just someone putting on Twitter or X now that oh I don't like this and this is terrible, you know, something can go viral and have a significant impact to your business from a perception perspective. All of those are challenges not least of which is delivering the proper therapy, which at the end of the day, it's about the patient, it's about the care. But now the people doing that need to have additional cybersecurity considerations. And that's and that's what we're here talking about. Um, yeah. And, and also when you look across these, right, I think one of the things 
important things to that we like to highlight is when the app gets compromised, there are several things that are compromised, right? They could be sensitive data in there uh, that gets compromised. You could have IP. If, if this app is running specific proprietary algorithms that could get compromised, just disruption of care, right? Depending on what your app does, if it's unable to do something because of a hack or it's being tampered, disruption of care is also a big thing. So when we talk about app compromise in a technical perspective, the implications, like Andrew mentioned, are very many, right? And all of them will matter to your business in some to some extent. And going on on regulation, right? When we've talked to customers and we're helping them find the right mix of security um, into their products, these are some that always come up, right? Um, we're a global um, vendor, so we, we're dealing with companies in the healthcare space in different regions. And the FDA, BSI, and things from the Congress, these are things that our customers and prospects bring up, right? Um, but the key thing about most of these, as you know, is these have evolved over the last couple of years. Earlier, a lot of the regulation that we saw and what our customers were dealing with were pre-market, right? And to Andrew's point, most of these are non-binding guidelines, right? So we saw our customers kind of do a whole bunch of pre-market submission documentation to suggest that we understand the risk we are taking and here's what we will do if something goes wrong, right? But the big question they're asking us is, well, how do we operationalize this? Right? It's one thing putting into a document for pre-market submission, but then from a technology standpoint, how do we do this? How do we fix something without having to do a recall right? all the time? Um, and with these being recommendations, I don't think people were doing this as a letter of the law. right? Uh, they just had to convince a lot of the regulation that they have thought about it, they have a way of doing it. Patch Act is the one recently where we see the regulation trying to tie these recommendations to some co form of code so that they can enforce it to some extent, right? So that has been a very positive step in what we've seen. Um, Andrew, you, you have these conversations as much as I do. Is yeah. there something about the way this regulatory market is evolving that you find insightful? Yeah, there is, hopefully. Uh, I will say on that last page, you'll you'll notice that we use the term when, when your app gets compromised. It's not a question of, of if. Um, this is a, you know, apps of value are attacked all the time. Um, and one of the things we're going to talk about here in a little bit of size is, do you even know? Are you even aware if you're being attacked? What's your visibility into that? Um, but the the reality of if there's a finding in post-market, there's a, that's a trigger where all of a sudden a whole bunch of stuff has to be done in a certain amount of time, or you get pulled from the market, or there's additional consequences. And that sort of hair on fire reaction to an unexpected risk is very expensive in terms of time, resources, money. It, there's all sorts of things that happen. And so even though you may not know what's going to hit you, you know something's going to happen. And so you need to have a plan and a system in place where you Hopefully your hair's not on fire. It's just a, oh, it happened. And now we're going to work through this process that we've already imagined. And we're going to solve the problem. We're going to get back in the market and take care of our customers. Um, and so that's, you know, that's what we're going to spend a little bit of time on here as we continue. So, Andrew, why don't you kind of take going from there? I mean, why is it so hard, right? We all of us have a hundred apps on our phone, right? They're pretty pervasive even in healthcare now, and it's they're exploding as we speak. Why is it so hard to protect these apps when they're connected to medical devices, right? What, what's the problem here? Well, th there are a variety, and you guys can, can see these bullet points, but some of it is just straight up doing security can be hard, right? And so the expertise to both be an, a, a developer or even an excellent developer that is focused on feature and care and product innovations and it's not necessarily the same, same skill set as being able to do things securely, secure SDLCs, secure coding practices, 
you know, what is what is enough security is something that we hear a fair amount. It's like, well, how much do I need? When when do I know that there's enough? Um, also, the fact that an app can go on almost anything. Like how many different Androids are there? Even iPhones, which are pretty monolithic, but there's all sorts of different versions and there's old versions and there's new versions. The ability to test on everything is really daunting. And so the question is, well, how much do I test? What is enough? Now, I'll also say one of the things that all apps are subject to is once you release them, you know, you post them to a public app store, they are. it is so easy to pull them down, rip them open, look inside, either just because people are curious or they have some sort of malicious intent. Or at least I know in some markets in the medical space, there's actually not malicious. They're, you know, really motivated hacker parents that want the market to move faster than the FDA and the submission guide. So they're trying to essentially hack their own biology with these apps, which is potentially leading to a, a, an undesired outcome. Um, the, the tooling and the methods to break your stuff, it's almost like you can go in a store and buy the tools. It's just not that hard. Um, and so from an organizational perspective, this is so hard because there's so much to keep an eye on. And it is very difficult for a team of people even focused on this to manage that. And so that's our, our take on this is it's not enough to do the basics anymore. You need to do the basics plus and do this dynamic approach to, to protection. And certainly once a, once an app becomes the primary interface for a mobile device, it's incredibly important that it, it works as designed, right? If it's a fallback or a secondary or a view only or a read only, great, no problem. You've got a, you've got a, another way to deliver care. But if it is the only interface to a medical device, the need to, um, to protect that and have confidence of that security posture is incredibly valuable. So Christian, yeah, go on. And, and yeah, no, I think that, that was a great point because I think we know a lot of our customers are telling us the same thing, that the mobile app and device are becoming central to the device, the healthcare provider, and the patient, mm -hmm. right? So all three of them are feeding and taking data off mobile, right? So you have a lot of data being stored, processed, inputted on this device, and it also makes it very attractive for someone to break in, right? And for those of, I mean, most of you all know, healthcare records are probably the ones that fetch the most on the black market as well, right? So there's huge monetization claims. Um, Again, as Andrew mentioned, no longer just a display. And when we talk to uh, vendors in this space, most of them are on the path of putting more in the mobile app for convenience of the patients, right? So the, the richness of functionality is only going to get more on, in this space. Um, a lot of threats, right? I mean, threat data... Um, you probably see a lot of vendors publish this through the year, but what we thought we will do is we are mobile focused uh, from a Zimperium standpoint, and we just wanted to give everybody a glimpse of what do we see the most, right? And the first one will be a no brainer to everyone. It's malware, right? Now, why is this interesting? One, we hear ransomware all the time, right? The ransomware has hit a healthcare and hospital. They couldn't get in. They had to move to paper record keeping and so on. In the mobile world, ransomware presents itself as malware, right? It's not as prevalent as you see on the server side, but it's starting to become very prevalent, right? Because the opportunity to lock doctors out, lock healthcare providers out of their phones is quite attractive if you're trying to disrupt the system. Um, so that one we see, and that's why we see the stats here, malware growing 50% year over year. And when we looked across the 100 million or so devices that we protect, one of every 20 devices has malware on there, right? It's just that the end user thought he was downloading a game, a utility app, and he just didn't know, right? So it is not only becoming prevalent, 
it is starting to show up on quite a few number of devices. Andrew, what's your thought on phishing when it comes to mobile? Well, phishing is, that's the easy entry point, right? That people click on phishing links and that's what gets them the malware. Um, and uh, even just yesterday, I was talking with someone on, man, they try and they try to, to train and, and help people to understand, but it's almost, you need to protect people from themselves. And that, frankly, that's why we, a lot of medical devices have so much security, like on the physical device, so that you don't prick your finger or you don't do it incorrectly. There's a very clear approved path. Well, that is so hard on someone's personal device. How, how do you know if one of your many customers has a phone riddled with malware? Well, usually the answer is you don't. And part of our, our conversation here is you'd probably like to know that. How might you know that? And that's what we'll talk about it. I think it's just on the next, the next slide. You want to go up? Take a crack at what we're seeing. Yeah. So, look, I mean, we can both talk about this, but this is what we're finding. I mean, OWASP is one of these standards of, you know, how to sort of best ways to build apps to make sure you're you're validated to a certain level of security. Um, there's <laughs> these findings are not completely unexpected, but again, this is something that a healthcare provider or an app director is not going to know. You're just sort of guessing that you're building your app well enough and your customers are protected well enough. Some of these things are quite difficult to do. Like doing cryptography is hard, right? There's sort of some straightforward ways to get it done. But if your team, as, as mentioned on the, the slide I talked about earlier, if your team is not experts in cryptography, it's pretty easy to kind of put a foot wrong. And so this is where you work with experts to make sure that what you want as a result is the way you've constructed your system. Um, Christian, do you have any call outs that you'd like to to bring out on this one? Yeah, so uh, I would say, you know, the, the medical device industry is quite heavily regulated, right? Like some of the other industries we work with. So when we're talking to customers and prospects and helping them to figure out what additional things we need, there's always this argument of, hey, we're quite heavily regulated, so we're doing everything, we're checking all the boxes. But the problem on mobile is checking those boxes is quite different from how the device and app gets attacked. Cryptography, great example that Andrew mentioned. Choosing a robust algorithm, as unfortunately might be great to check the box, but is not going to be sufficient on mobile because the secure hardware on a device is kind of compromised if a device is compromised, right? If you don't have great key protection practices, it doesn't matter how robust your algorithm is. And that's what the attackers are after. They just want to steal your key. They don't try to break your robust algorithm. So as regulated as these spaces are, there, there are places like this where there are gaps and we're helping customers because most malicious attackers on mobile, that's what they're trying to get into. Binary protections is a great one. And Andrew, you alluded to this. They are hundreds of obfuscation and whatnot solutions out there, right? But the question we ask them is, do you know if someone tries to compromise your app, right? Detectability is a big question on mobile, right? If, you're, if you have a, a medical device that's connected to a consumer app, which runs on 30, 40 million devices, do you know, would you be notified of something someone was trying to break in? So these kind of questions come up when we're talking to our customers. And so we're helping them plug these holes that go beyond regulatory guidance sometimes, right? It's more driven off the way mobile apps and devices are being attacked. And that's what we're helping them with. Um, a lot of times, if we look at the two spaces where mobile apps are quite mature, they're most mature from what we see in banking, right? Financial apps. So we... We looked at 100 financial apps and says, well, how is healthcare, which is also booming right now, relative from a security standpoint? And as you can see, there we see very similar issues going on on both, right? Now, both of them check boxes, right? Both of them are doing things that you traditionally do to secure the mobile app. But the problem is the threat is evolving at such a pace that there are other gaps that are starting to show up. Andrew, your take on some of the things we see here. Yeah, and actually we've got a question um, sort of related to this, but the question was about, can the medical device 
industry use some of the regulation that is applying to the payments and banking industry? And the answer is, of course, yes. Now, it's not direct one-to-one, but from a right. mindset of, well, what do I need to protect? Well, I need to protect keys, and I don't want my app to be reverse engineered. And obviously, I shouldn't release apps with known vulnerabilities. You know, there's those steps. So there is some value in reading yeah. Um, some of the regulations for the banking industry to go, oh yeah, well, we should do that too. But then the 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 issue that we're really seeing, and it's come to the, the forefront with a couple of our customers, is that there's this gap between both, not even the time when you release your app, it's when you finish the design of the app. And so you say, great, this is what I'm going to build. And then nine months later, it is built and submitted. And then it's put into the market. And it is already nine months old, uh, you know, a year old against known threats when that that architecture was decided and defined and implemented. That gap of, say, nine months or a year has been filled by this time aspect that I mentioned before, where the hackers are coming up with new ideas, there are new attack tools, there's new attack vectors, there's new operating systems where... It just, you didn't know about them. So how could you possibly plan for them? And so yeah. that's cat and mouse of, well, I thought I had it good, but now that we're out, we see we've already got a number of issues. How do you solve that particular problem? And we do have an answer for this. We're not sort of hy- hypothesizing and going, that's a tough one. Yeah, there's there's no real way for you to do that. There is a way to do this. Um, but it is a, it's a timing question balanced with security and therapy delivered to, to patients. And so that's what makes us a bit of a naughty problem, but um, one that we can help you with for sure. Yeah, and the question about regulation, we deal with so many sectors in the industry that are heavily regulated, right? Whether it's financial services, right? Whether it's soft pots, payments, FinTech, uh, healthcare. When you boil down these regulations to their core essence, they're very similar, right? All of them are essentially trying to put rules in place to protect sensitive assets, right? It could be data, it could be access, it could be some just the app itself, which means disruption. So they are catering to an industry, but when we boil them down to just fundamental security things they're asking you to do, they have a lot in common. Yeah, so you could borrow that essence, uh, even though it might be fintech, um, you can absolutely borrow those, right? It's just that these industries care about some things more than the other, but they all care about the key things. Uh, it's a great question. Um, okay, Andrew, why don't you kind of give us a summary of, you know, we talked about the market, the trends, why are apps so hard? So the three things we want people on the webinar to take away when we think about medical apps, you know, healthcare apps connecting to medical devices. Yeah, so this this first one, that, that, the last word in this first one, untrusted, that's that's the center of this idea. Not only are they, they're being attacked, they're, they're not designed to be bulletproof against attack. They're consumer devices. They're an iPhone. They're a Samsung. And so they are inherently untrusted. And so your development, your deliverable has to make the assumption of zero trust, which is a big buzzword elsewhere in cybersecurity. But that's the mindset that you need to have. Um, that the second point is that new malware is constantly coming out. We've got mobile global mobile threat reports that talk about the number of new malware instances coming out every day, and it's in the thousands. Like, it's just ridiculous. And so just from a awareness of what's out there and what you might need to do, the, the threat is real. And um, oftentimes the, the, the bad actors don't care what they're attacking. They just want to break in. Um, and so... The, the last point we want to leave you with, and, and we'll talk through this from the product side here in just a slide or two, but the next generation of mobile security is dynamic. It is how do we embed things into our applications so we have dynamic response to threat, be they both known or unknown. And that's the that's the, the bit of the magic of what we can do with what's called our ZDefend product, is that we can protect you from unknown threats and close that gap and not have the requirement of releasing new applications into the market and yet changing your security posture over the air, which is really amazing, uh, really amazing technology. Yeah, and you know, also when we talk to customers and this is the kind of the way they've explained it to me at times is 
you know, earlier when you look at just connected medical device, you know, their concern was their device, their software connecting to the internet. That's what they were worried about. Welcome mobile app. Now you not only have to worry about your stuff, now you have to worry about your code on someone else's device and other software on that app, on that device as well, right? So the number of, not only has the number of variables gone up, but also the number of things that are outside of your control have gone up, right? And so they've essentially, it has essentially changed the scope of the problem when you think about mobile app connected devices. So where do we go from here, right? As Andrew mentioned, right? Based on our experience, working with so many customers in this space and other highly regulated industries, we thought we'll leave you with four or five things that have helped our customers, have really helped them progress through their mobile app security journey. First and foremost, I'll, I'll take this one, exploitable weaknesses early. Now this, everybody says it, right? And here's the difference. Most companies, when we talk to them, especially product teams, and if you're writing software, you know this, is they always say, well, we're scanning our code. We're scanning our code. The problem with mobile is it's a different beast. So scanning your code is great, right? You can do static, dynamic, whatever you want. But the question is, you need to find a solution that helps you say, whatever app I wrote for my medical device, is it prone to abuse in the store and on the end user's device? It needs to be a little bit more mobile focused, right? So look for solutions to complement your source code scanning solutions that help you give you identify vulnerabilities that are mobile focused. Uh, static protections, Andrew, I know you love this one. Yeah, well, and you do still have to do the basics. You know, we're not proposing yeah. that what the type of security you've done up to this point is not necessary. It absolutely is but it's the basic level of protection. It's it's the, of course, you've got this and that in a housing metaphor. Of course, you both have a door and there's a there's a door knob and a lock. You of course need those, but you're gonna need additional things to protect against modern threats. Um, as I jump to this point three is, you know, visibility is maybe something you don't have right now, or it's limited, or it's not enough. This is this awareness of threat and device state and application state is really valuable. And, and actually, I'll just jump to the fourth one as well. We didn't say determine whether the app is compromised. We assume that that's going to happen. And you might well have some awareness there. But the, as Krishna was just saying, is suddenly you have to worry about the device your app is on and all the other apps. Well, you might as a business or as a product organization say, hey, if I'm, if my app is on a device, again, riddled with malware, maybe I want to change my mind on how something happens, or I want to present something to the customer so that they're aware that they're in a risky posture. All of those are possible and potentially something you would want to do. Um, actually, I'll just run to the bottom, but here's where you get to determine if you even want to act on this information. Right? There's a certain level of, call it technical ignorance, if you don't have an awareness of state. Once you have that awareness, you get to decide, well, that's that's just great information to have, or maybe I want to take action on that. And so the first step is that visibility and then determining what the next step is. So knowing these five points, right? This kind of forms the essence of what we do as a company, right? So for those of you who don't know, don't know a lot about Zimperium, right? We do two things. We protect mobile devices and we protect mobile applications. And it's this unique viewpoint and insight into both these things that really has helped us provide the security that mobile device, um, medical device manufacturers have really needed when they're thinking about building companion apps, right? And what makes us different from a lot of other vendors is if you try to solve these problems in general to build a secure app in the market, you're going to end up with three or four different products that don't talk to each other. What we're offering medical device manufacturers is, is a single platform that allows them to secure their app during development and in runtime, right? And this has been very well received. As Andrew mentioned, we do a lot of business in this space. And to the most important point, right? Whenever you get into the mobile space, the things that are non-negotiable are people want it to be frictionless and they want real time, 
right? Think about medical device space, right? It's app has to be frictionless. You want real time information, whether it's patient treatment, diagnosis, whatnot. And your security has to be this way. It has to keep up. Um, as regulation catches up, if you just focus on being compliant, the threat landscape is going to present tremendous opportunities for hackers to expose your app. So be compliant, but also look at the threat landscape and try to patch these gaps as you try to secure your mobile applications. And with that, that's all we had for today. Thank you so much. Let's see if you have, Andrew, any final comments? Yeah, actually go back one slide. We did get a question um, just, oh. just a moment ago talking about um, some considerations of the data on the back end. Um, and I'll, I'll attempt to answer that one. So if the threat is, hey, my PII or my PHI is going to get altered or it's going to be changed is my, my response to the question that was asked, which was essentially a, if we're worried about backend breaches, how does the overlap of app security and cloud security kind of come together is one response is, can you trust the data hitting your cloud if you don't validate the, that the data hasn't been changed? That's That's one thing. And so if the hypothesis is I have a bunch of customers, they have a bunch of apps that those apps are, you know, streaming data into my cloud. If you're just blindly accepting it, there's a certain level of risk that the data is bad. And so you're sort of poisoning your own data set. So we would say from our perspective is you'd want to have data tampering awareness and app tampering awareness to see whether or not you could have a trust or a level of trust to the state of the device that's sending you this data. And if you do trust it, then you trust the data. But if you don't trust it, it's maybe questionable, which might call into question the value or the veracity. <coughs> now, some of the things that we do is we sort of look at the products that we have out here. One of these things that we've been talking about for, for dynamic response is this one on the right, which is a RASP, which is an SDK that lives in your application that does on-device protection and awareness and threat telemetry. All that data um, can go back into our console. Yeah, hey, thanks, Krishna. You know, all this data can come back. And what you get from this is, is my device secure? Has my app been changed? And has anything, is there anything risky that I need to be aware of? Now, they may not, not, maybe about, may not be a perfect answer for the question that was asked, but the point of having dynamic response to threat is, you can trust the app. You can trust the data. You can trust that what's on the device is legitimate. And so you can move forward. If there's a question, then you can take a different path, right? And so we are certainly seeing that for, for some of our customers that have been with us for a long time, they've been using you know, the vulnerability scanning and they've been protecting their app from reverse engineering with things like ZShield. They care a whole lot about the keys that Christian was talking about earlier. Like, you know, find the key, you can unlock the data. Well, you, you shouldn't be able to find the key. Keybox is fantastic for that. It's a world leading solution for doing this in software. Packaging that all together with ZDefend really gives you a, a multi-layered posture that can really help uh, app connected medical devices have a modern posture that can change over time and is a really flexible way to protect applications. Um, so that was kind of my, I'm not sure it, if, if I didn't quite answer the question and, and the, if the gentleman who asked that question had something, you know, wanted to dive a little bit deeper, of course, we'd be happy to engage with anybody, you know, on the webinar today to, to answer some further questions and talk with you more about what we do. Yeah, folks, feels, please do reach out. Um, we're Andrew and I, happy to engage in one-on-one -on -one conversations to talk about your specific case and what you're trying to do. So I would love to have more conversations. Dylan, back to you. All right. Awesome stuff, Andrew and Krishna. Um, certainly appreciative of the information and insight you guys provided today. Um, looking at the chat and q and it looks like you guys made my life a little bit easier. Uh, I don't have to read those, so thank you for that. Um, but uh, if there are no questions, you know, we'll uh, we'll close out the, the webinar. And like I said, I'd like to thank again our presenters and uh, the Health ISAC community uh, for their time today. Uh, and this concludes uh, the webinar and hopefully give you back some, some time in your day. Thanks, everyone. It was thank great you, to everybody. Be Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. <laughs>